Father, we just thank you so much for your son Jesus. Hallelujah. And we want to glorify you, Father. We want to lift up the name of Jesus this morning, Father. So, Father, I just pray that your Holy Spirit would lead us, Father. Bring your word alive to each one of us, Father. That as we read your word, as we study your word, Father, as your Holy Spirit leads us, Father, it would bring life. It would fill us with faith, Lord. We would begin to walk even in a deeper way. We would grow more intimately in our relationship with you, Father, with your Son, Jesus, with your Holy Spirit, Lord. Thank you, Father, for this morning. Amen. Well, this morning, I want to speak about the birth of Jesus Christ, one of the cornerstones of the gospel. The birth of Jesus Christ, one of the cornerstones of the gospel. In Matthew chapter 1, verses 22 and 23, so that all this was done, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child, and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. The virgin birth of Jesus Christ is one of the cornerstones of the Christian faith. Without Jesus Christ's birth, he could not have become the son of man. And without Jesus Christ's virgin birth, he could not have been the son of God. 1 Timothy 3.16 says this, Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up in the glory. Without controversy, there's no question, it is uncontestable that the great mystery of godliness is Jesus Christ and his redemptive work. That is uncontestable. Great is the mystery of godliness. The English word for mystery has the underlying meaning a secret which people have tried to uncover, but which they have failed to understand. But the Greek word mysterion means that which was not known before, with the implication it is being revealed to at least some people. So the English word gives the idea that nobody knows it, but the Greek really means it's a mystery that wasn't known, but now has been revealed, at least to some people. Mysterion is not, that so, is not something that people have tried to understand, but no matter how hard they have tried, they failed. But, and it's not like a hide-and-seek game where God tries to hide something from people and they fail to see it. But it's where God reveals something that before no one understood and is now revealed to those who've chosen to want to know. Matthew 7.7 7 says this, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. The great mystery of godliness is not that it's something that God has hidden so no one can find it. It's something God reveals to those who respond to the wooing of the Holy Spirit and begin to ask and seek and knock. The mysterion, the mystery, is something that God wants to reveal to people, but only those that seek and ask and knock will actually receive that revelation. You never had people say, well, I don't know if there's a God or not. You know what you say? Well, ask him. Begin to seek and say, God, are you really there? That's what happened with me. I had heard the gospel, and, 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 and at first I thought it was all foolishness, but years went by, and I began to think, maybe there's some truth to this. And I would ask questions and listen, and, but the day that I began to say, I'm going to pray and say, God, are you really there? Is Jesus really is your son? I need to know. I can't live with this emptiness anymore. And I began to pray that way. And within a couple weeks, God answered that. And the reality of the gospel, the reality of who Jesus Christ is, came to me. He revealed that mysterion, that mystery. Great is the mystery of godliness. The Greek word for godliness refers to living a life devoted to God is victorious and pleasing to him in every way. Many religions and, pe- religions and people have tried to find the secret to living a godly life that is pleasing to God. Many religions and many people have tried to. But some have tried to please God through good works, religious rituals, and even self-sacrifice. But in themselves, all these things fail to deal with the true root issue. 
hearts that are contaminated by sin. You know, you ever met people that they, they do all sorts of nice things, and, but in their heart they still have the same problem. None of those things have really dealt with their hearts, and so they really aren't godly. And their lives are really not pleasing to God, even though outwardly they look like they're doing nice things. But inwardly, they have the same problems. No matter how hard a person tries to live a godly life, still hidden deep in their hearts are sinful, lustful, selfish desires and thoughts. They can cover them up by their good works, by their seeming self-sacrifice, but they're still there. However, in the gospel is hidden the mystery of godliness that will transform us into the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Receiving the mystery for, a God, for living a godly life begins with God was manifest in the flesh. His miraculous birth and concludes with received up to glory. His redemptive death and his glorious resurrection and ascension into heaven. That's what sandwiched the gospel, right? His miraculous birth and his suffering death and glorious resurrection and ascension. The beginning of the great mystery of godliness is Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who is carnate as a man through the virgin birth. If one negates the virgin birth, the entire gospel falls apart and becomes totally powerless and invalid. If the virgin birth did not take place, the gospel is nothing. Liberal Christian theology began or begins by denying the authority of scripture, removing any possibility of absolute truth. Liberal Christian theology then denies Jesus Christ's virgin birth as a mythological fictitious teaching. They just totally dismiss it. The conclusion to this path of unbelief is not only denying the deity of Jesus Christ, but seeing his crucifixion, not as a sacrifice for the sins of all mankind, but simply a man being murdered because he challenged the religious and political leaders of his day. Haven't you heard that before? They say Jesus was murdered. He wasn't murdered. He sacrificed his life. The result the ultimate result of this type of theology is that Jesus Christ was a man who was murdered for a cause and remains dead. There is no resurrection and there is no salvation through Jesus Christ. The great deception of modern liberal Christian theology is it's not Christian. That's a deception. When somebody says modern liberal Christian theology, the deception is not Christian. The Bible makes it very clear that someone cannot be a Christian by simply trying to adopt certain aspects of Jesus' teachings while ignoring the very person of Jesus Christ as the Son of God and all that entails. The miracle of the virgin birth makes the powerful declaration, declaration that Jesus Christ is God. The virgin birth is in your face saying he's God. Liberal Christianity was most influential with mainstream, mainstream Protestant churches in the early 20th century when proponents believed the changes it would bring would be the future of the Christian church. They said, the gospel message is old now, so we'll reinvent it, so it will appeal to more people. And they developed a theology without the inspiration of scripture, without the deity of Jesus Christ, without the redemptive work of Christ. However, liberal or mainline churches in America experienced a decline in membership of 70%, from 40% of the, um, of the American Christian population to 12% between 1930 and, and 2000, now being no longer mainstream but a small minority, where the evangelical denominations have a greatly increased in number. The evangelical denominations, those who continue to preach the gospel, preach Christ, preach the word of God, they're the ones that have grown. They're the ones that have, have moved on. They're the ones that have impacted society. Liberal theology removed the heart of the message of the gospel. They removed the mystery and left only the empty shell of a philosophical and social gospel. 
Most people are no longer satisfied with religious rituals and humanistic philosophy, but they desire to know if there really is a God with whom they can have a relationship and who will intervene in their lives. In other words, they want to go, is, in short, is God real? Is God real? People aren't here interested in saying, well, let's stand up and sit down, let's stand up and sit down, let's say this, let's say that, and okay, goodbye, you know, that was a nice service. They're not interested. They're saying, can I relate to God? When we sing, we're not doing it as a ritual. We are saying, God, you are real. You are real, and we want to acknowledge that, and we want to worship you. That's what people want. People want to know, is there really a God? Can I really know him, and will he really intervene in my life? That's what people want to know. The entire Old Testament has been crafted around the truth that God the Father is going to send his son, Jesus Christ, into the world to be born of a virgin to redeem mankind through his sinless life, his sacrificial death, and his victorious resurrection. The profound importance of Christ's birth can be seen by the details and numerous prophecies given in the Old Testament and fulfilled in the New Testament. But why is it so important that Jesus Christ be born as a man? Why is it? Why couldn't God redeem us in another way without Jesus Christ coming? You ever thought about that? Why couldn't just God redeem us another way? He's God. Why did Jesus Christ have to come as a man for us to be redeemed? Well, the answer to this question has many facets. We're going to explore only a few of the most important points. We could literally speak for weeks and weeks and months about this one question. But we're going to only look at a few major points. Isaiah chapter 45, verses 18 to 21. For thus says the Lord, who created the heavens, who is God, who formed the earth and made it, who established it, who did not create, his, create it in vain, who formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord, and there is no other. I have not spoken in secret in a dark place of the earth. I did not say to the seed of Jacob, seek me in vain. I, the Lord, speak righteously. I declare things that are right. Assemble yourselves and come. Draw near together, you who have escaped from the nations. They have no knowledge who carry the wood of their carved image and pray to a God that cannot save. Tell and bring forth your case. Yes, let them take counsel together who has declared this from ancient time, who has told it from that time. Who, ha who, has, who, ha who has told it from that time? Have not I the Lord? There is no God besides me, a just God, a Savior, and there's none besides me. In Isaiah 45, verses 18 to 21, we see a couple of themes which are reinforced and emphasized. God did not create the heavens and the earth in vain. In other words, God has a purpose in everything he does. Those that seek God do not, do not do so in vain, but can be assured they will be rewarded. If you seek God, you will be rewarded. It's not in vain. Also, it says, the Lord speaks righteously. He says, God is just. And he's a savior to all who call upon him. We see that God is faithful to his word and that he's just, that he's righteous. In God's economy, righteousness, justice, and purpose are foundational. In God's economy, righteousness, justice, and purpose are foundational. In other words, God always acts true to his character in a righteous and just way. And everything he does conforms to these principles. Everything he does conforms to the principles of righteousness and justice and his purposes. If God cannot violate any of these principles and truths because he is just and righteous, how can God then forgive transgressions and sins? If he can't violate any of his principles of righteousness and justice, how can he then forgive transgressions and sins? In any economy, everything has to balance out or the economy fails. You can't have an economy that doesn't, doesn't balance. The balance sheet always, uh, it always must balance between liabilities and assets. If you run a company, you know that you always will have 
the, bal- the liability side and the asset side balance. It has to. It's impossible for it not to, unless you're a bad accountant. And in reality, it still balances out. They just haven't figured it out. Psalm 85, 10 says this. Psalm 85, verse 10 says this. Mercy and truth have met together and righteousness and peace have kissed. Mercy and truth are two opposing principles in the economy of God's balance sheet. Do you realize that? Mercy and truth are actually opposing principles in God's economy. Mercy extends forgiveness when laws and statutes have been broken and transgressed. That's what mercy. You've failed, you've broken something, you've sinned, and what does God do? Mercy is extended. But truth is black and white and demands that every sin and transgression be exposed and the full price be paid. You ever met truth people? You know what truth people say? We got to deal with this. Nothing can be hidden. You got to deal with this. You've got to pay this price. You, in other words, it's all about truth, truth, truth. Now that's very good, but there ain't a lot of mercy in that. Righteousness means justice, judgment, and punishment has been fully meted out. You cannot imagine a righteous nation that does not deal with iniquity, does not deal with lawbreakers. You wouldn't say it's law, righteous. So righteousness means that justice, judgment, and punishment have been fully meted out. Peace speaks about security, tranquility, and freedom from the fear of judgment and punishment, right? Peace speaks about security, tranquility, and freedom from the fear of judgment and punishment. Righteousness and peace are also opposing principles when it comes to those who have sinned and transgressed God's law, which includes every single human being. Psalm 85.10 clearly states that in God's economy, mercy and truth are able to meet together and be in total agreement. Can you imagine that? Mercy and truth can be totally in agreement. It also states that judgment and peace have actually kissed each other. Only God can reconcile mercy and truth and actually have judgment and peace embrace one another. How can God reconcile these opposing principles of mercy and truth so they are in harmony and justice and peace so they can warmly embrace one another? I'll give an example of how it doesn't work. Let's say there is a man who, in an uncharacteristic fit of rage, killed another man. So the day he came and he stood before the judge for the judge to pronounce judgment on him. And before he was to be judged and, 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 and condemned, the woman of the man who was standing there cries out to the judge with her small children around her and say, have mercy on us. I know my, my, my husband, he, he did a terrible crime, but he lost control of himself and, and of course he murdered him, but that was uncharacteristic. But if you put him to death, I'll be a widow, my children will be fatherless, and we will be destitute. Our lives will spiral down, and what will become of me and my small children? If the judge looked at that and commuted his sentence, that would be mercy, wouldn't it? That would be mercy. But on the other side of the courtroom is this woman whose husband was murdered. Say, wait a second, wait a second, what about me? My husband is killed. I am a widow. My children are fatherless. We are destitute. What about us? What about us? So if he shows mercy, that's not justice. And if he shows justice, then there's no mercy. But in God's economy, he says that mercy and truth have come to agreement. And righteousness and peace have kissed. Forgiveness does not simply mean that sin, the wrong, or transgressions have simply been disregarded or have disappeared because in reality that can never happen. Sins, transgressions, and wrongs cannot just simply disappear. 
Because when you have done something wrong, there is a scar to that. There is a loss to that. Just like a balance sheet with liability and assets, nothing disappears. It just moves from one side of the ledger to the other. But it's in the balance sheet still. When a person who's been wronged willingly forgives someone, he gives up his right for judgment, vindication, and punishment, and agrees to absorb the loss himself and release the other person from shame and guilt. In other words, when you forgive someone, someone does pay the price. It's you. You're saying, I'm giving him my right for vindication. I am removing from that person his shame and his guilt, and I am taking that on myself, not the shame and guilt, but the sorrow that he's caused. I forgive him. I forgive what he said to me about me. I forgive how he wronged me. I forgive how he lied to me. I forgive how he maybe hit me. I forgive all that, and I no longer seek judgment and vindication and punishment on him. And I accept to bear the burden of what he's done against me. That's forgiveness. Second Corinthians 5, verses 18 to 21. 2 Corinthians 5, verses 18 to 21. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. I refer to 2 Corinthians 5, 18 to 21, as God's ledger sheet. God's ledger sheet. The words reconcile or Reconciliation are used five times in this verse. The Greek word reconcile can mean to reestablish proper, friendly, interpersonal relations after they have, they have been disrupted or broken. It can mean to make things right with another. But the word reconcile in the Greek has the same meaning also as in English. The Greek word reconcile can also be used as an accounting term which means to exchange coins of equal value or to make things balance in terms of exchanging money. In other words, let's say someone gave me a, a, a lunid, a $1 coin, and I gave him four quarters. We would say that it was reconciled. That was an even exchange, right? If he gave me a loony and I gave him three quarters, and after counting out his three quarters, he says, you cheated me. You ripped me off because that's not reconciled. In other words, you've given me less than I've given you. So to reconcile is an accounting term, meaning to make equal exchanges so the balance, is in, so the balance sheet is still in order. So it says, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ. We see God himself reconciles himself through his son, Jesus Christ. So Jesus is the one that now brings a reconciliation. In other words, he, he's the one that brings, out, uh, brings us to a point of we have a right relationship with God. But he does that by reconciling or balancing the accounts out. He balances the accounts out. God established friendly interpersonal relations after we had broken them through our sinfulness. So how did God, through Jesus Christ, reconcile us to himself? That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them. We see that the first step in us being reconciled to God was that he didn't impute or account our trespass to us. So the first step in, in God reconciling us to himself is he didn't account our sins and our trespasses and our failures to us. But if God did not account our trespasses and sins to us, then what did he do with them? They can't just disappear. And it says this, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. 
God took all our sins and put them on Jesus. And in turn, he gave us all his righteousness and placed it within us and then called it an even trade. We were reconciled. You see what I mean? He took all our sins upon himself. He gave us all his righteousness and he goes, it's an even trade. You are now reconciled. The balance sheet balances. Our liabilities, sins, were moved onto Jesus' side of the ledger sheet and his assets, his righteousness, were moved onto our side. He took our liabilities and we took his assets and God said, that's an even deal. Jesus Christ at Calvary became that sin offering for us. Upon the, cr upon the cross of Calvary, Jesus took upon himself our sins, curses, disobedience, and rebellion. He died in our place, suffered what we should have suffered for all eternity. He took it all upon himself. Also it says in 1 Peter 2, by his stripes we were healed. Jesus took all our sicknesses and pains upon himself and he gave us his divine healing and health and the Father also called that an even trade, reconciled. And then it says, and he has given us the ministry of reconciliation. God has given us something more. He has given us his ministry of reconciliation that through Jesus Christ, God would use us to bring others into right relationship with him. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. We are Christ's representatives on this earth and we have been entrusted to share this message of reconciliation. We are now his ambassadors. An ambassador is the high re highest representative of one country to another. And we are his representatives. And we're representatives of his reconciliation. So one of the ways we share about how Christ has reconciled us to God is by extending the same forgiveness to those who have been wronged us, being willing to allow Christ to absorb the hurts and pains that others have inflicted upon us. In other words, how do we teach people that God has a ministry of reconciliation. Well, we're ambassadors of that, which means we do the same thing. In other words, when we allow others to, to reconcile with others, we then have the result of showing them the pattern how God can rec reconcile them to himself. In other words, when someone wrongs us, and we forgive them, they see, oh, you mean I wronged you and you do not demand anything from me, but you forgive me. For uh, Colossians 1.24, Colossians 1.24, Paul says something very interesting. I now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church. This is an astounding statement. Let me read it again. I now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church. What does Paul mean by filling up in his own flesh the sufferings that were lacking in the sufferings of Christ? If I said to you there was something lacking in the sufferings of Christ, you'd look at me and say, Howard, you are totally wrong. Didn't Christ pay for the price of every man, woman, and child? Every sin you've committed, every transgression, every curse, every sickness, he took it upon himself for every man, woman, and child that was ever born and would ever be born. And that is truth. But if that is true, then why does Paul say that those things are lacking in the sufferings of Christ I absorb in my own flesh for the sake of his body. One thing that Christ could not do on the cross that he could only do through us, having us forgive those that wrong us and hurt us now. When people, Christians and unbelievers, even Christians, right, wrong us and defraud us and speak evil of us, and we absorb those hurts and respond by forgiving them, blessing them, and doing good to them, 
we are filling up in our own flesh the sufferings that we're lacking in the sufferings of Christ. You realize that? That when someone wrongs you and we forgive that person, we are now absorbing that so that they can know the love of Christ. He says, Paul says, I, I take in the sufferings that Christ couldn't take in so that his body would not be hurt, so his body would not be destroyed. How many churches have been destroyed because believers are not willing to forgive one another because someone is not saying, I forgive you even if you don't ask for forgiveness. I choose to love you and bless you even when you curse me. How many churches have been destroyed because people do not let go of those things and are willing to absorb those hurts? But Paul says, I'm willing to absorb those afflictions that Christ could not absorb on the cross because they're happening now. And I'm willing to have Christ in me absorb those things. And I'm willing to bless them. And I'm willing to do good for them, even if they don't repent. Christians sometimes do a real bad job of witnessing because we're vindictive. We're judgmental, and sometimes we're just mean. And we wonder, why aren't more people coming to Jesus? But when we are willing to allow those hurts to be absorbed, that we no longer are vindictive, we're no longer judging them, we're no longer wanting judgment and condemnation to them, but we're willing to forgive them. We're willing to bless them. We're willing to pray for them. Then the body of Christ is built up. And Paul says, I'm willing to forgive. I'm willing to be wronged and not seek judge, justice and judgment and condemnation for that person. It will change the body of Christ. It will change our lives it will change the lives of those around us. And then we can be ambassadors so people can see what it truly means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. We can forgive them because we know that Jesus died for their sins also. Do you know you find the most wicked man in the world, but Jesus died for their sins also. And if they will choose to receive Christ, they will receive that reconciliation, that forgiveness too. As we forgive them, we show them the way to come to Christ and have their sins forgiven so they can be reconciled to God and saved. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Now that's a very interesting phrase that he's speaking to Christians. As believers, we're not only justified and thus have Christ's imputed righteousness, but now we must daily learn to submit to his Holy Spirit and walk in a righteous way so our fellowship with God is unbroken. You know, so many times, you know, we, we are born again and we now have a righteous relationship with God because our sins are forgiven, but we don't have a very good walk with God. In other words, there's still things in our hearts and lives that are wrong. And so our relationship with God on a daily basis is unhealthy still. Not because of God, but because of us. And Paul is saying, I plead with you, be reconciled with God. Every day, have your heart clean. You know, I just, we're just finishing a book on the book of Job. And uh, my, my son made fun of me that the book that I wrote on the book of Job is twice as long as the book of Job in the Bible. And he says, how can that be? I said, I don't know. But anyways, um, but one thing about the book of Job, it says that he was blameless. That he was blameless. What does it mean, blameless? The Bible, when he uses the word blameless, doesn't mean Job never sinned, that Job never made a mistake, that Job never failed. I mean, we all are sinners. It meant that Job knew how to deal with sin. That as soon as he failed, as soon as he sinned, he immediately repented. He immediately got his balance sheet right again. 
He immediately had that right heart with God. You know, when you're not walking right with God, even if you're a Christian, if you're not walking right with God, you don't want to pray. The last thing you want to do is be hanging around Christians that are excited about God. You ever seen a backslidden Christian? They, they see Christians, they're saying, praise the Lord. They're, they're gone. They're gone. Why? Because they're not reconciled with God. Because there's sin in their lives. And they're not walking with God. And they don't want to talk about God. They don't want to hear about God. They don't want to do anything, even though they knew the Lord. But Job knew to deal with sin. As soon as he failed, he immediately confessed it. He immediately asked for forgiveness. He immediately received that. And he was always walking in reconciliation with Jesus. Hallelujah. And so Paul is saying, I implore you, be reconciled with God every day. Every day be reconciled with God. I like that point. I'm going to write this down. You know, I don't know about you guys if you like this, but I like my sermon, so I take notes on myself. <laughs> Why did Jesus have to be born of a virgin and become a man? God can neither die nor take upon, him, upon himself our sins because he is holy. So he became a man to pay the full price of our sins and die in our place. See, God can't die and God can't take our sins. So God became a man so he could take our sins and he could take our curses and he could die where we should have died. If Christ was not born as a man, he could not be a redeemer because he had to take upon himself the sins of mankind and only a man can pay that price. If Jesus Christ had not been born a virgin, he wouldn't, wouldn't, ha wouldn't have been God. And only God has the purity, the power, and the righteousness to live a perfectly sinless and righteous life. And one which he could impart to all those who put their faith in him. Do you realize that Jesus, when he walked upon this earth, he lived the perfect life, the life that we couldn't live? So when we die, when he died for us, he took upon us our sins, but he gave us the asset of his perfect life that he lived on this earth. It pays to take accounting. Jesus Christ, being born of a virgin, points to the reality that he was both fully human and fully God. 1 Timothy 2.5 says this, For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. The man Christ Jesus. The humanity of Jesus Christ is essential for him to be our mediator. To be a mediator, one has to be able to converse and relate to both parties, and thus Christ as the Son of God could approach God his Father, and as a man, Jesus could reach out and sympathize with our humanity and frailties and take upon himself our sins. To be a mediator, one has to be on good terms with both parties. And we were not on good terms with God because of our sins. In Genesis chapter 3, verses 14 and 15, Genesis 3, verses 14 and 15, so the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go and you shall eat dust in all the, day, all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. The first messianic prophecy in the Bible is found in Genesis 3.15 and speaks about Jesus Christ's birth ministry, and victory. God put enmity between Satan and his seed, and his Satan's seed is our sinful nature, and the seed of the woman, which is Jesus Christ who was born of a virgin. When man sinned, the very sinful and rebellious nature of Satan was planted in our mortal flesh. God's solution was to send his son, Jesus Christ, born of a woman, to destroy Satan and his works. His works are our sinful nature. It says what Satan was going to do to the seed of the woman, Jesus. 
you shall bruise, or the Hebrew really means crush his heel. This signifies that the sinful and re sinfulness and rebellion of mankind would join with Satan to crucify Jesus Christ. Satan and Satan's seed, our sinful nature, were together, joining together to crucify Jesus Christ. Although Jesus suffered greatly, it did not result in defeat for God. It actually resulted in victory. But then it says what will be accomplished. He... Jesus, the seed of the woman, he shall bruise or crush your head. This signifies that in the process of Satan crucifying Christ, he and his kingdom of darkness would suffer a fatal blow. The crushing of Jesus' foot and the crushing of Satan's head actually occurred concurrently. In other words, at the same time. While Jesus was hanging on the cross for our sins, his heel being crushed, Satan's kingdom and the power of sin was being destroyed. His head was being crushed. Through Jesus Christ's suffering, death, and resurrection, sin and Satan were totally defeated. You see that? The suffering of Jesus was compared to his heel being crushed. It was extremely painful, but it's not fatal. It didn't destroy Jesus. It actually brought forth victory. But the crushing of Satan's head represents the total destruction of Satan, the seed of Satan, and his kingdom. Hebrews 2.14 says this, Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is, the devil. At Calvary, we could say that God put his foot down once and for all against Satan. Satan's plans to destroy all of mankind. In the process, his heel was crushed. Jesus suffered and died for us. And the head of Satan was crushed. His kingdom and his power was destroyed. I like what my brother Harvey says, is that it's actually one action. When Jesus put down his foot with such force, that force caused his heel to be crushed. But in the crushing of his heel, that the head of Satan was crushed. But he had to drive his foot down hard enough to destroy Satan. And he was willing to crush his own heel so the head of Satan could be crushed. What a wonderful savior and how wonderful that God himself would come to be born through a virgin as a helpless baby to become the savior of mankind through a supreme sacrifice at Calvary. After studying only one small aspect of Jesus Christ's birth, we can respond with breathtaking awe at the perfection and the beauty of God's love and his plan of redemption for us. Even though Jesus Christ's birth is so wonderful, it is noteworthy that nowhere in the New Testament is ever recorded that his birthday was ever celebrated. Do you know that? You ever notice that? There's never a time in the New Testament they celebrated Jesus' birthday. In fact, for the first three centuries, the church never had a specific day to celebrate Christ's birth. It wasn't until the 4th century that Christmas was celebrated and the date was chosen was to coincide with the celebration of the pagan god Saturn and the winter solstice. Do you know why the 25th? Because the 21st to 22nd is the, is the shortest day of the year. And then by the 25th they notice the sun is starting to get brighter and the days are getting longer and they say it's the new birth. The birth of the sun again. But it was a pagan date. In fact, my, my uh, own opinion is that I believe that Jesus was born around September. And I, my opinion is that I think it lines up with the Hebrew, Hebraic feast of, tab of trumpets. When there is a proclamation. And I, I, I sense, I, when I look at it, I see that trumpets picturing the birth of Christ. And tabernacles picturing his life upon this earth. And once again, trumpets a second time will represent his return. And once again, tabernacles represent the millennium, where he dwell with men. In the fourth century, religious rituals such as Christmas and Easter were established, but they did not reflect scriptural commands. They were actually mixtures of pagan rituals and scriptural principles. Christians began to celebrate different aspects of Christ's life because they failed to see the whole picture. If we dissect Christ's ministry into pieces, we lose the full impact and picture. Jesus is not a baby in a manger. 
he is still not hanging on a cross, nor is he still lying in a tomb. He is resurrected and seated at the right hand of the Father. You know, I remember being Jewish and, 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 uh, and, and you know, seeing these Christian rituals. And, uh, you know, and I always thought, well, Jesus was born at Christmas time and he died at Easter. He only lived three months. You know what I mean? Like, that's what I kept thinking. So what happened to the rest of the nine months? Like, I just couldn't figure it out. You know what I mean? Because the problem is when we start to dissect his ministry, everybody focuses Jesus is a baby. Right? Everybody sees a little baby. They have a thing and he's a baby. He's a manger. And then on Easter, he's hanging on that cross. Well, I'll tell you what. Jesus is no longer a baby. And Jesus is no longer hanging on a cross. And Jesus is no longer in the tomb. But he's resurrected. And Jesus at the right hand of the Father. That's where Jesus is. Now, there's nothing wrong with having a Christmas dinner. There's nothing wrong with having a family celebration. But they're cultural. They're not scriptural. That's all. And there's nothing wrong with saying Merry Christmas. But it's cultural. It's not scriptural. I remember one time God said to me, you mean you don't celebrate? This guy, Christian, looks at me and said, you mean you don't celebrate God's birthday? And I looked at him and said, well, I hate to tell you this, but God doesn't have a birthday. He's eternal. Right? Before Jesus was born, he was still Jesus. He came from heaven, came down to earth, died for his sins, went to the hell, came out, was resurrected from dead, and he's back with the Father again. So, if you do Christmas dinner with a family, that's fine. If you like to send cards out, that's fine. If you like to give presents, that's fine. Like, don't get weird on me, guys. It's okay. But as a church, we're not putting Christmas trees up and we're not going to pretend that this is the day he was born. Well, it's actually, they say 25th, right? But anyways, we know that that's not true. But the important thing is he was born and he was born of a virgin and he lived the perfect life and he died for his sins and he rose from the dead and he's at the right hand of the Father. That's the important thing. I like what it says in 2 Corinthians 5, 16. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh. Yet now we know him, thus no longer. Paul makes an interesting statement. We know no, no more anybody after the flesh. In fact, even those who have known Christ after the flesh, we know him no longer, thus so. You know, when, Jesus, when, when Paul wrote that, some of the disciples that saw Jesus' earthly ministry were still there. The apostles, many of the apostles, many of the other disciples were still alive. But they said something. You know, Jesus' brothers, half-brothers, his mother, they no longer saw Jesus as just a man. They saw him as a son of God. They knew him as a man. They saw him walk the perfect life as a man. But then their eyes were opened and they realized he's not just a man. He's the son of God. And so they no longer saw him as their older brother or just another man, but they saw him as the son of God. So it says, even though we who have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer, because now we know who he really is. He's our creator. He's our God. We now see Jesus not as a baby or even, even as one hanging on the cross, but as a glorified son of God seated at the right hand of the father. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So we're going to pray and right now, and, and I'm going to ask the worship team to come forward. We're going to sing another song and then we're going to have an opportunity for prayer again. And we're leaving the front open for those who want to come up in the prayer team after we finish worshiping one more song and and just uh, encourage you to even spend a few minutes just on your own praying.